In this video, we will be reviewing the basics of vital signs. So this is a video that I wish I had when I first started nursing. Um, in this video, we're going to review body temperature, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturations. These are uh, basically the essential vital signs that you're going to need to know. But more importantly, we're going to learn about context. Um, nursing school, I feel, did a great job of teaching you, you know, what the normal blood pressures are, heart rates, vitals, everything like that, etc. But what they don't do is they don't add a lot of context to those things until you get out into the real world. And that's what I'm going to try to implement a little bit more today. So body temperature. Uh, how do you take a temperature? Well, you can take it orally with an oral thermometer. You can take it rectally. This is mostly used in uh, newborns. You can take an auxiliary. This isn't really used in um, in uh, healthcare. Tampanically, these are the ones that you'll most likely see. Basically, it's a little bit of a probe that goes into your ear. And infrared. I'm sure you've seen these with, uh, with uh, COVID coming up recently. Um, basically, they're just a little bit of a laser that uh, shines at your forehead and it basically tells you your temp. These are not ideal in a hospital setting because they are not very accurate. Body temperature continued. So um, you're going to see this chart throughout this video. Um, the first part is lingo. Uh, lingo or terms, basically, sometimes we use abbreviations in nursing. Whether they be approved or not, we still use them. Um, the first one is temp, uh, that basically is just short for temperature, obviously. A febrile means no fever, febrile means you have a fever. Um, normal range, uh, normal ranges can vary depending on uh, how you're taking the temperature. Um, most cases you'll, you, you'll do it uh, tympanically. Um, and in that case, it's between 35.8 degrees Celsius and 37.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, Essentially, uh, anything greater than 37.5 doesn't mean uh, you should freak out, but it definitely does mean that you should be watching the patient a little bit more closely because there is a possibility that could, they could be uh, uh, brewing an infection or something. Uh, what can cause temperature to fluctuate? Well, obviously the ambient temperature, if it's really hot in the room, their temp might be a little bit higher. Um, physical activity, if the patient is, is hot, sweating because they're doing stuff, obviously that can uh, have an effect on temperature menstrual cycles, uh, numerous uh, different thyroid disorders, and definitely the biggest one is, um, is uh, infections or sepsis. Um, usually when somebody's uh, you know, getting sick, you're going to notice that their temperature goes up. This is gonna be basically the, uh, the telltale of, of telling that uh, somebody is uh, starting an infection. Um, Treatment, well, we can obviously treat things with uh, antipyretics. I mean, that's going to treat the temperature. So obviously, if you give somebody Tylenol, their temperature should come down. Other medications like Toradol work as well. Um, however, these are mostly only treating the, uh, the, the symptoms of, um, you know, something like an infection. So, for example, um, if somebody's got a, a urinary tract infection or UTI, that's going to cause them to have a temperature. Um, the uh, antipyretics are only going to treat kind of like um, the discomfort that's caused by having a fever. You're going to actually need to treat the cause of the temperature, um, which in some time, in some cases is uh, an infection. So you're going to like if it's antibiotic related or, or bacterially related, um, you're going to want to have the patient on an antibiotic. Heart rate. So. How do you check somebody's heart rate? Well, there's many different ways. First off, uh, the most common one in hospital is a pulse oximeter. That's the thing you can clip on somebody's finger. It'll tell you both their O2 sats and their uh, pulse rate or heart rate. Um, sometimes mach machines can have uh, difficulty you know, getting a reading. Uh, sometimes if the patient's finger is too cold, you're gonna need to warm up their finger or you'll just have to take the uh, the pulse manually. And you can do this by pul uh, palpating the pulse radially. Um, you, typically it's done ra radially. And there's another way of doing it and that's uh, auscultation. So you will have to use your uh, your stethoscope for this one. Listen to the patient's apical pulse. You're gonna have to listen, you're gonna have to count for uh, 60 seconds and that will give you um, the patient's heart rate. Um, it's important to remember that some medications uh, on some units, uh, depending on what your policies are, will require you to take a 60 second apical pulse prior to giving a medication. One of the medications um, um, that they often do this for is called the jock. All right, heart rate continued. 
So here's our chart again, lingo and term, so pulse. Uh, if somebody asks you what the pulse is, basically that's another way of saying what the heart rate is. Tachycardia is gr when the pulse is greater than 100 beats per minute. And um, sometimes nurses talking between each other will shorten that down by saying the patient is tachy. Uh, bradycardia, that means when the person's blood pressure or, or uh, heart rate, sorry, is uh, less than 60 beats per minute. And uh, sometimes that's referred to as being brady. There are many different types of rhythms you can you can uh, you can feel the heart. You know, S1, S2, S3 are hard sounds. This, this is a video in itself, so uh, maybe I'll put one out a little bit later. The normal range uh, that's uh, obviously between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Over 100, you're tacky. Less than 60, you're Brady. Uh, and obviously, heart rate is always expressed in a unit of beats per minute. What can cause heart rate to fluctuate? Well. Uh, stress is one. If you're stressed out, your heart rate's going up. Um, also, on the other side, uh, like if you're relaxed, like for example, if you're sleeping, you're in a deep sleep, your heart rate is probably going to be lower. Body position, if you stand up from a, from a laying down position, that puts a lot of load on your heart, especially as you get older and your heart rate's going to go up. Same concept with physical activity. If you're, you're running around a lot, your heart rate is going to be very high. Uh, medications, sometimes they can have an effect on raising or lowering a heart rate. Infection, this one's also a pretty big one because um, obviously if somebody's got an infection, you'll see a higher temperature, but you're also going to see a higher heart rate in most circumstances. Thyroid disease, uh, there's lots of different heart arrhythmias that can affect uh, heart rate, such as atrial fibrillation, and there are uh, several, several um, heart conditions that can also affect heart rate. Uh, treatment, well, sometimes we can use medications to slow down uh, the heart rate. For example, um, uh, beta blockers. I just did a medication uh, uh, a video on um, different types of blood pressure medication, and one of the topics we discussed were beta blockers and how beta blockers work. And obviously they work by slowing down the heart rate and making the heart beat less forcefully. Um, sometimes, uh, like for example, if you've got a patient with a low heart rate, um, then you might not want to give some of these medications, like for example, if they're on metoprolol, if their heart rate is you know, 50, 51, uh, you might want to hold that medication and notify the attending MD. And obviously pacemakers can uh, also have an effect on controlling somebody's heart rate. Blood pressure, so the first thing, what is blood pressure? Well, blood pressure it can be defined as the force that is being exerted on the walls of the arteries. How is blood pr pressure expressed? Well, it's a, basically expressed in kind of like a fraction. So it's systolic over diastolic. So uh, 180 over 80 is an example of blood pressure, obviously, um, where each unit is, is uh, a number of uh, millimeters of mercury. That's actually the unit for each of these numbers here. Um, what is systolic pressure? Basically, systolic pressure is uh, the measure of force on the walls of your arteries during the contraction phase. So when your heart squeezes, um, that's going to be uh, obviously the pressure is going to be up. That's going to be the top number right here. Um, typically, we pay more attention to the uh, the systolic blood pressure than the diastolic blood pressure because this one's going to be the one that gives you the most problems. Uh, what is diastolic? Well, diastolic pressure is the measure of force on the walls of your arteries between beats. So it's important to remember that approximately one third of uh, the cycle of your heart beating is spent during the systolic, uh, systolic blood, uh, blood pressure and two thirds, um, is, uh, two -thirds of time is spent uh, in, in uh, diastolic pressure because your heart beats and then goes into a resting phase. The resting phase is twice as long as the systolic phase or in other words, beating phase. Um, if you wanted to calculate, uh, this is a little bit extra, if you wanted to calculate mean arterial pressure, um, basically you do um, the, systolic uh, the systolic blood pressure uh, plus two times the diastolic pressure divided by three. Uh, not really relevant for this video, but an extra piece of information for you. Blood pressure continued. So uh, how do you take a blood pressure? Well, there's basically two ways of taking a blood pressure, two main ways, I should say. There are others. Uh, the first one is uh, with an automatic blood pressure. So basically this is, uh, you know, you, I'm sure in the hospital you've seen these cards that they roll around, they, they strap a cuff, they press a button on a machine, and it gives you a result. Uh, 
The other one is manually. You often see these at doctor's offices where they'll use a stethoscope, they'll use uh, uh, a sphygmometer, and um, and uh, they'll pump it up themselves and they'll listen to it themselves. I'm sure there's plenty of videos on YouTube that tell you how to do that. Uh, I'm not going to make one. All right, blood pressure continued. So we've got our chart again. Obviously, it's a little bit more full because uh, we have a lot more to talk about. So some lingo in terms, BP obviously is a short version of saying blood pressure. SBP, that stands for systolic blood pressure or the number on the top. Um, hypertension or being hypertensive, that's defined as uh, systolic blood pressure of greater than 130 or 140 millimeters of mercury. We'll discuss more about normal ranges when we get to this category. Um, and hypotension is obviously the opposite of that. So that's when your systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeters of mercury. So the patient can either have hypotension or be uh, hypotensive. Like, uh, sorry, they, they could either have hypotension or be hypotensive. It just depends on how you're wording the sentence. Um, another way nurses talk is sometimes they say the patient's blood pressure is a little bit soft. Um, soft just kind of means you're on the lower side of the spectrum for blood pressure. Also, an important thing to know is uh, what's called white coat hypertension. For example, if somebody goes to their family doctor or they haven't been to the doctor in a while, they see the doctor come in and in, uh, what's historically been in a white jacket. Um, they get nervous, their blood pressure goes up as a normal response. Um, that's not a true representation of what their what their blood pressure normally is, and um, it, it, uh, it's, it's not an accurate representation of what their blood pressure is. It's just a reaction of, of how they're reacting to the environment that they're currently in. Normal ranges. So this is where things get a little bit uh, kind of gray and convoluted. Um, historically, 120 over 80 has been, you know, the textbook blood pressure. But pra best practice is always changing. You know, it, 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 these days it truly depends on what book you read. More and more, what uh, what uh, we've been seeing in hospitals is uh, that patients most often have, uh, um, you know, their normal of of a blood pressure. And that's not to say that um, you know it's normal for a patient to walk around with a blood pressure of 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 170 over over um you know 85 or whatever 170 is also obviously a, a high systolic blood pressure that's you know it shouldn't be normal for everybody but you know as you get older as you get into your 80s or 90s some people you know they, they typically ride around you know they could, it could be 130 140 you know sometimes 150s blood pressure medications can always be tweaked but um it's important to remember that if you're taking somebody's blood pressure and it's that high and you look through the previous vital sign records and it's always been that high well that's probably around their norm um, obviously medications can be tweaked to adjust it but it's not something to panic about an important thing is if you're going around and you're taking people's blood pressure uh, it's important to kind of remember like is this before or after they've gotten their blood pressure medication so Sometimes if you take a patient's blood pressure in the morning before you've given them their medications and their blood pressure is, you know, say like 160 over, you know, you know, 85, um, that's a little bit of a higher blood pressure, but uh, take a look at their medication record. They probably have a bunch of medications coming up. Um, if they're consistently that high in the morning, then maybe they need something a little bit more at night and uh, that's something you could bring up to the doctor and you know, blood pressure medications will can be tweaked. Once you're on blood pressure medications, it doesn't mean that they stay the same for the rest of your life. They'll get tweaked throughout your entire life. What can cause blood pressure to fluctuate? Well, you know, almost every, almost anything. Um, emotions and stress, we kind of talked about that with the white coat hypertension. So, um, if uh, you know if you're if you're nervous or, or something, your blood pressure is obviously going to be high. Dehydration. Um, sometimes the patients or sometimes nurses refer to this as saying the patient is dry, meaning they're dehydrated. If you don't have um, uh, you know enough fluids, if you're not intaking enough fluids in yourself into yourself, uh, your blood pressure can probably go down because you have less blood volume in your. Uh, in your blood vessels and therefore less pressure being exerted on your blood vessel wall. If your blood pressure gets too low, your body's gonna have a, a very difficult time uh, perfusing your vital organs. Infection, obviously infection is gonna be in almost every single vital sign that we're gonna discuss. Um, 
if uh, you know one of the th one of the signs of sepsis sepsis is uh, a drop in uh, blood pressure medication or, or sorry a uh, drop in uh, blood pressure I should say um, another one is trauma this goes hand in hand with bl uh, bleeding so obviously if somebody's coming in and they're hemorrhaging their blood volume is going to go down so is their blood pressure uh, improper medication sometimes uh, patients are on you know uh, too much blood pressure medication um, you know blood pressure doesn't stay the same for your whole life it's it's constantly got to be monitored and and, and adjusted um, so there's a chance that uh, a patient might be receiving too much um, blood pressure medication and obviously if you come to hospital you're uh, you know it kind of everything changes in your life and it's very important for us to monitor your blood pressure in uh, in a hospital setting so we can adjust your medications as we see fit and remember it's always important to take con context into effect or, or to, to to take con context into account when taking somebody's blood pressure if uh, like for example when people arrive at my hospital um, they typically come from another site uh, the roads in my hospital or the roads in my city are not very good so they've come through from a very bumpy ambulance ride they're typically older in age they're typically stressed out that they're going to a different site it's normal for their blood pressure to be temporarily up when they come off that stretcher um, usually we'll take it if it's high we'll give them a little bit of time to kind of settle relax and um, their blood pressure typically comes back down uh, treatment well so vasopressors are a class of medication that usually bring up blood pressure and then on the opposite at the end of the, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum you have antihypertensives there are tons of different uh, you know blood pressure medications I've made a whole video about it um, I'll put the uh, I'll try to put the link in the description if I remember that's a great video to watch they all work differently but uh, obviously you can take a medication to lower your blood pressure also an important aspect for nurses is not giving certain medications for example if your patient's blood pressure is you know 91 over you know 53 you probably aren't going to want to give them a lot of blood pressure medication you're probably not going to want to give them you know their whole dose of lasix you're going to want to notify you know you know the doctor and um say listen do you really want these medications given and they're they're probably going to adjust them or just hold them for a day and then they'll reassess them tomorrow um so I, you know, part of part of my career, you know, I've, I've worked in both hospitals and uh, long-term care, uh, and um, I've always been surprised at how effective uh, pushing oral fluids can be. So in long-term care, you all, you don't often have you know the resources to you know IVs. You can't just throw in an IV bowl of somebody, give them a little bit of fluids to bring up their blood pressure. You know, if you take their blood pressure and their blood pressure pressure is low, you can also uh, you can always encourage uh, them to take. Uh, an increased amount of oral fluids uh, more uh, more fluids in your body the more uh, blood volume you have therefore the higher your blood pressure is going to be obviously in the hospital we can just throw in an IV give them a bolus go from there all right so this is a, a little bit of a bonus um, a, a bonus slide um, it's called troubleshooting blood pressures uh, basically if you're a student you're probably going to be taking a lot of blood pressures when you first get to clinical it's going to be you know one of the basics of nursing so what do you do if you get a really high or or low blood pressure reading and what if the machine gives you like an error message so one of the first things that you that you have to remember is the fact that uh, machines are not always perfect sometimes they can have problems sometimes they'll give you you know with like a weird result so when you get a, a weird result so um, you'll, you'll double check the other arm you will always want to do bilateral uh, blood pressures if somebody's blood pressure is um, um not kind of where you want it to be sometimes you'll look through their uh you know their previous vital signs and say you know they're always you know the stock's always 130 140 um but today they're they're you know in the 80s um take it again on the other arm and then you can kind of compare the two and you have more data to to work off of um also try repositioning the cuff if it's giving you an error message and uh, or, or a weird result reposition the cuff usually I do this by just immediately switching to the other arm and uh, I'll also make a I'll also take a good look at the you know the cuff size you can't be using you know a massive blood pressure cuff uh, from you know a 350 pound lady to you know you know a 65 pound lady you know it's just not going to give you the same reading um, another thing is um, sometimes you're taking the 
patient's uh, blood pressure and they just have this uncontrollable urge to, you know, tell, uh, you know, to tell you their life story. Um, you know, sometimes it's okay to ask the patient to stop talking, relax, just so the, the blood pressure machine can do what it does. Um, also, if the patient is, uh, you know, of sound mind, you can obviously tell them to stay still, stop, you know, looking for the remote, eating, whatever, just stay still, relax, it'll take, it'll take them, you know, a minute at tops, and then you'll get a more accurate blood pressure reading. Um, oh, the last, uh, the last, um, uh, you know, tip I could give you guys is to actually look at the patient. Um, so this is a personal story of mine, so I was working uh, you know, as uh, obviously as a, as an RN, and um, one of the students on the floor was saying uh, came up to me. I was in charge that day, and they came up to me and they said, you know, I'm I'm, I'm having a hard time getting a, a blood pressure on uh, on one of the uh, one of the patients down the hall. It wasn't a patient I was too too familiar with, but um, uh, you know, kind of without thinking, I went down uh, there and obviously um, you know to do my due diligence, take a look at the patient, see she was see what's going on. And the reason the patient was, uh, uh, or the reason the nursing student couldn't get the uh, the blood pressure on the patient was because the patient was actively dying. Um, the thank God the patient was uh, palliative. I don't know why we, why the nursing student felt it was appropriate to take a blood pressure on a palliative person, but um, you know it's important to to look at the patient and and the the, the patient was clearly dying i think they lived for like maybe another hour they probably didn't have uh you know much of a blood pressure left and that's why the machine was was uh was kind of freaking out um that was you know a long time ago the best uh um advice i got was to look at the patient sometimes you can get overwhelmed with data and everything like that but if you physically lay eyes on the patient and see how they're doing that's going to give you a lot more context and uh how you should be proceeding forward so respiratory rate and oxygen saturations these two uh they i i usually put them together so there's one unique thing about uh the respiratory rate and uh, that, and when I say that, I mean there's one unique unique thing about this vital sign, and that's because you can control it. Um, you can, like, I can't sit here and, and tell my heart rate to go up and down. I can't do that for my blood pressure, um, but I can do that about my uh, my respiratory rate. So I can breathe as fast as I want to, and I can breathe as slow as I want to um, when I'm thinking about it. But when I'm not thinking about it, you know, my body's um, doing it. Um, you know, however my body sees fit. Um, so the respiratory rate is uh, you, basically you just count the number of times a patient breathes in one minute without them knowing that you're counting. Uh, one of the mistakes I made in, oh, this is way back when, when I was in nursing school, I remember um, uh, I was in a patient's room. I said, okay, I'm just going to count your respirations now. And the, immediately the, uh, the, the, the instructor just looked at me and I, I, I knew what I had done wrong because the patient was like, oh, well, now I'm breathing funny. And I'm like, oh, whatever, live and learn. Uh, respiratory rate is always shown as breaths per minute. And sometimes it can be written like RR18, respiratory rate of 18. Um, oxygen saturations. So you can't actually, you know, visually see somebody's oxygen saturation. I mean, you can see if somebody's cyanotic or blue, that's probably going to be a bad sign that uh, you know their oxygen saturation is not great but it's not actually going to give you a number and in order to measure um, measure uh, an oxygen saturation uh, you'll need a pulse oximeter respiratory rate and oxygen saturation continued so back to this chart and lingo in terms rr respiratory rate sats short for saturations uh, sometimes you can use that in a sentence like what is the patient satting at Tachypnea means abnormally uh, rapid breathing, usually described as greater than 20. Bradypnea is abnormally slow breathing. Uh, you can think back to, um, you know, tachycardia, tachy, fast, brady, slow. Um, and this is usually defined as a respiratory rate of less than 12. Um, hypoxia, for most patients, it's this, um, or, or sorry, uh, if the patient is hypoxic, I should say, Usually that's described as um, having an oxygen saturation of less than 92%. The normal range. So in adults, usually typically the normal range is between 12 and 20. 
um, oxygen saturations for most healthy adults are, you know, above like 94, 95%, ranging all the way to 100. Um, however, that's for most normal healthy adults. Some illnesses have different uh, ranges. So for example, if you have COPD, um, historically, what you want your COPD patients at is between 88 and 92%. Um, you don't want them, uh, you know, too much higher in most circumstances because that will actually suppress their, uh, their respiratory rate. And, you know, that's a whole video in itself. Basically, what you need to know is um, it's okay for patients with COPD to, to have, have a lower um, oxy oxygen saturation because in those circumstances, it's actually good for them obviously too low is obvious is is bad as well um so what can cause respiratory rate or o2 saturation to fluctuate well obviously activity if you go for a run you're going to be breathing much harder sleeping um kind of the opposite end of the spectrum if you're not doing anything your respiratory rate should be very low um infection uh sometimes if if you have an infection your respiratory rate will go up um Stress and anxiety. Obviously, if you're nervous, you'll be breathing. Um, you'll be breathing at a more rapid rate. Um, CHF or congestive heart failure. Basically, if you've got a lot of fluid on your lungs, um, you, there's a chance that your oxygen saturation might uh, not be as high as it should be because your lungs aren't working as efficiently. COPD. We've kind of discussed that already. And obviously, if you've got like a pneumonia or something like that, you know, there's a wide variety of respiratory illnesses. Um, your oxygen saturation could be lower. So what do we, uh, what do we, how, how can we treat respiratory rate and oxygen saturation? Well, um, obviously, um, most hospitals have like a, like a standing order to apply oxygen if somebody's oxygen, uh, you know, levels tank. So you can always apply oxygen, many different ways of doing it. You can do it with nasal cannula, a rebreather, venti mask, lots of different, uh, Lots of different ways you can apply oxygen to somebody. Um, but most of the time, the treatment is dependent on the actual cause of, um, you know, whatever you're looking at. So kind of like we discussed, like if, if somebody's having, you know, CHF, their saturations are low, you, um, you might want to ask the doctor for an extra dose of Lasix in order to get that extra fluid off of their lungs. And that will in turn help their breathing and increase their oxygen saturation. And I guess uh, I, I could obviously add that. If somebody, if we really need to protect somebody's airway and uh, their respiratory rate, we can uh, we can intubate the patient. Um, but that's usually in you know more critical care areas. So that pretty much summarizes the uh, the basics of vital signs. Um, if there's one thing you can take away from this video, just remember to take the vital signs and put them into context. Um, you know, oftentimes there's reasons for why a blood pressure is a certain way or why an oxygen saturation is a certain way. Um, please subscribe. Um, I think we've just hit uh, 22,000 subscribers, which is, which is awesome. And if you've got any suggestions for future topics, please comment them below and, uh, and uh, let me know your thoughts. Thanks so much.